So anyway. So anyway, we're ten minutes into the program. We've said nothing. We've done nothing. <laughs> Welcome to our <laughs> show. Welcome it's called Seinfeld. So listen, what shall we talk about? Because um, I, I will warn, not warn people, but tell people our 11 o'clock show is packed. I'd like to the talk gears. about my plane tra travels, actually. What else? What else? Because I had a... Can I say a, a word that rhymes with itch? Oh, absolutely. I, 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 there was a bitch working for U.S. Air in, in Las Vegas. At the terminal or where? At the gate. What's up? She really pissed all me right, off. This, all right, this is good radio. Let's, she yeah. pissed me off. Tell me. I was having a lovely time in first class. Yeah. And and she just knew that I'm a gold member. And what she did is I... Uh, you but know, this is not on the plane. You said she was at the No, gate. no, because what she do? I was flying for... I, I also fly from, fly from maximum mileage. Okay. So I, I had a three hop it through, from San oh. Jose. Mm -hmm. So I went from San Jose to Phoenix. And from Phoenix to Las Vegas. Which was actually, oh, that was the most brilliant flight. We flew right over the western edge of the Grand Canyon. It was oh, nice. gorgeous. Yeah. It was nice and clear. The pilot was hilarious. And um, and it, it was a beautiful trip in first class. Well, wait a minute. From Phoenix? Wait a minute. You flew from Phoenix to, to Vegas? Yes. Well, that flight takes 12 minutes? It takes, and actually, by the clock, it only takes four. But it actually takes a minute. Because Phoenix, Arizona is our only state now. Wait, on daylight time zone? Yes. Because Phoenix refuses to turn their clocks back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good for them. So, what, actually, if, when I went, if, if you fly Las Vegas, Phoenix, uh, San Jose. Yeah. Even though you're in the same time zone, you have to keep changing your watch. Oh, my God. Because Arizona will not change time zones. But, I mean, if you just took one flight, uh, we've had this discussion. I, right? But you make more miles. Yeah, I know, but it and stretches out an hour-long flight into five hours. But you want to know something? With the connection time, it only lasts an extra, like, half hour. It's really Three weird. flights last an extra half hour? Yeah, because if I flew in New York, you can't fly direct New York to San Jose on ah, USA. Okay. So you can take a connection in either Phoenix or Vegas. Okay, right. but if you take the connection in Phoenix or Vegas to get to San Jose, see if I connect the connection from Phoenix to Vegas in Vegas, I'd be taking the same Vegas to. to um, all right, I've already lost you, but it's okay. all right. I believe you. Because so so basically, having three connections only costs you like half an hour more than two, but you get into well, there's still miles. two. But all right, all right, fine. And I get but first class. Tell me about the bitch. So anyway, I'm running from plane to plane because I have no way over time. <laughs> <which> I <laughs> yeah. told you. And I sit there and I go, well, maybe in the um, airport I can get something to eat because, unfortunately, even in first class on a one-hour flight, they give you oh, they, they just those snacky things. That is you. this going to be about bringing food on a plane? No. Oh. This is about, uh, and I sat there, and I'm looking around, and all I see is Taco Bell. Mm. So I said, okay, better than nothing, I'll go get a Taco Bell salad. But I'm also looking, and it, 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 my flight was, I think, at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it boarded at, or 6 o'clock, I think, and it boarded at 5.30. It was about 5.20. Okay. And, I know, and a lot of times they want to get the planes off on time, so they load the planes and they close the gate yeah. and a little bit early. You know, Earlier than the half before hour? Before than 6, before 6. Oh, before 6, yeah. Yeah, yeah but they, they, they board at 5.30 and they, they, they board yeah. for like 15 minutes and that's it. So I politely went over to the gate and I said, hi, I'm taking the plane to uh, New York. Do I have time to get... Uh, to go to the Taco Bell. She goes, I don't know. I said, when are you boarding? Yeah, right. I said, are you ready to board? She goes, well, as soon as the plane clears, right? I said, okay. But you think I have time to run over there and do it? You think, you know, thinking that she knows. Right. She's in that airport, she knows how fast the Taco Bell is. She knows. And actually, what I was kind of waiting for her to say is, okay, I'll watch for you, and we won't let you miss mm. the plane. So instead, she starts, I don't know. I don't know. And she goes, I don't work for Taco Bell. I said, really? With, with, with U.S. Air on your sweatshirt? You don't work for Taco Bell? How hilarious. I mean, how surprising and stuff. So, oh, man. I, I, I'm just trying to tell you. Know, I'm just trying to be nice and tell her I'm not going to be. I, I want to go to get some, something to eat. Yeah, I mean, the time that you were, you were bantering with the city. You I know. Because the well, line, let me tell you, I did go to Taco Bell. You and did they, go. they took this freaking sweet time about it. Maybe that's why she didn't want to answer. <laughs> but but it, it's not even that. She could just say, okay, I know you're not going to be there. What's your name? I'll make sure you get it. Just tell me when you come back. You know, it's, it's like saying yeah. someone... You're I'm probably not the first person to do this either. Right. You know, someone has to make a phone call. And or... it sounded like it, it, was, it was maybe 50, 60 feet away. So she goes, look for me, you know, flailing my arms and legs, coming back, going, hold the plane, hold the plane. 
But mm. I, you know, I hate it with bad customer service. And the, and the rest of U.S. Air, I mean, ever since America West took it over, it's been terrific. Uh, so they got this one lady who. So like, she should be fired, and she should. As I, as I told it, yes, I did. I wrote a letter. And mm. I, t I, t I showed her my first class ticket. I said, when I'm finished with you, you'll be happy to work at Taco Bell. You, did you really say that? I said that as I boarded the plane. Wow. Oh, she was really bitchy. What else did she say? I mean, that was She was just, she was like, she's like snobbing. That's me. a great line. I'm, I'm proud of because you. Because she just goes, oh, I don't work at Taco Bell. How do I know if you'll commit? How do I know how fast it's going to be? It's like, I don't know. You freaking spend your whole life in the airport 20 feet from a Taco Bell. <laughs> you know? That's, which, what's her name? Let's, let's, let's call her out on the air. Um, oh my god, I think, I, Last name, anyway. No, I just got her first name, I, I can't, I wrote it down, I wrote it on my boarding pass, and that was that, I forgot it on, on But you wrote a letter, and you, were you able to mention her name? I mean, mm -hmm. oh, I told her, the, I told her to get them the gate I was on, the flight she worked. Good for and you. And her first name. I, I, I said... Because all she had to do was be nice about it, and say, look, I, I can never guarantee, and maybe the line will be ten minutes, maybe they're slow, maybe they're fast. But, but really, the, the thing that she should say so is, wait, okay, I acknowledge the fact that you're here, you're waiting for the plane, mm -hmm. and you're going to Taco Bell, which is all like 40 feet yeah. away. But she could also say, hey, look, if you're not back by 10 to 6, yeah, too or, bad. Or know. she could say, I can page you. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I guess they There's can. There's a whole bunch of things they could do. I mean, I had I had one like that. Actually, I had kind of one mean one on the way. What did it stop on the way? Uh, Where? Maybe it was, it was in Phoenix or something. On the way over there or on another flight. They were all melding my head. I'd been traveling. <laughs> yeah. But I had another one where I'm starting to talk to this woman. I was, I forgot I was asking her some sort of really, really easy question. Yeah. And she shot and you? The, no, no, no. And another agent just goes, the, oh, someone's, the, someone wants to talk to her and they're like, shove the phone in her ear. And it's like, excuse me, I'm talking to her. You know, I waited till she got yeah, off the yeah, phone yeah. and I said, excuse me, I was talking to her. She goes, well, her, well she goes, well, her, the manager wants to talk to her. I said, it doesn't make a difference. I was talking to her. Yeah, yeah. Well, can you say, excuse me? Can you apologize? You know, be, have some coop. Have a, you know, didn't your mother send you to school to learn how to do things the right way? I'm, I'm with you, dude. I mean, I mean, I just, and, and they're all about customer service. <laughs> they're representing the airline. Yeah, that's right. With, with a hundred, a hundred and two hundred people. Well, hey, on think plane. about it. Think, we, what do we do? Uh, what is our, you do a few things. You have the, the, the yeah. parties and balloons and you do the, but you're also a theater critic. Right. You go to the theater and I go to the theater and who do we deal with? We don't deal with the producers. Right. We deal with the press agents. Press agents. Most of the press agents, Delightful, nice people, yeah. busy people, efficient people. Right. Every once in a while, more often than really a lot of be, we run into real jerks. Name names. Um, <laughs> Merle Debusky, but that that goes back. But he 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 saw God. He he really did. And a couple of people at an agency, a very big one that we both know, that that can be kind of needlessly un or or unresponsive, if not unpleasant. Right. Yes. yes. Now, what are they in? That's customer service. I know, I know. To the media, to the press, it's customer service. Of course. And it's, it's, if you ha even have to say no, which I'm sure a lot of times they have to do, they can say no nicely. That's their job. You know? Mm -hmm. I, I, so if you're saying, but, but it's customer service, it's not a universal thing. I know. But, but especially for, for a huge business like the airlines. You know, the, the customer service is real important. And, and I've gotten letters because I fly so much. I get letters from the president, you know, the, the, not, uh, not directly to me. <laughs> you know. Dear Mr. Goodman, oh, I'm yeah, so how are you doing? Uh, yes, we hear, we hear your, street, your street is uh, fixed up nicely. We hear, how are your gutters, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you like to have a mojito with me next time you're at the Admiral's Club? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got mojito and Admiral's Club in the same sentence. Yeah, wasn't that good? That was very good, David. I've been mean, using the, this new dictionary. <laughs> it's in visionary. <laughs> But uh, I, I can think of all these new um, words. <laughs> can we, ha Ted, Can we have an apple teeny sometime? <laughs> an apple teeny? I haven't heard that one in a long time. <laughs> I'm a pomatini. A pomatini? Yeah. I don't Probably too big. I'm going to L.A. What am I going to ask for? Mojitos. What are mojitos? First time I ever had a mojito was in L.A. It was when way back. Are they like when girly drinks? My play drinks? was being done out there. What? Are they girly drinks? No. Sounds like a pirate drink, actually. It's fabulous. What they do. It, and it's a simple darn drink. You can order a virgin one if you don't want uh, the rum in it. But it's rum. 
You can order virgins in L.A.? There's just one or two left. <laughs> <laughs> They're ugly as hell, but... <laughs> <laughs> Mojito. We don't bring your answer. Crushed ice, okay, some rum, <laughs> lime juice, and sugar, and crushed, pressed, um, uh, what do you call mint leaves. David? Yeah. You had me at sugar. I know. <laughs> <laughs>
they say, yeah, gotta have an opening number, a ditty that'll just knock them dead. But I haven't got an opening number, so I'll have to sing my closer instead. It's been a ball, folks. I have to sing my closer instead. The, the, that's all, folks. I have to sing my closer instead. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Did you know that I, Dave, am not just a fantastic radio personality, I'm also a playwright, and my book, Marriage, Babies, and the End of the World, is filled with the same humor I bring to Dave's Gone By every week. Funny, sad, true. Makes a great gift, Marriage, Babies, and the End of the World, only $20 hardcover, $12 trade paperback. To get your copy, call 516-295-1511 or email davesgoneby at aol.com. Print it, copy it, send it as a gift. All that and more at Hewlett Minuteman Press, your full-service printer, family-owned and operated since 1975. Photocopying, printing, wedding invitations, and great gifts, Minuteman, 1315 Broadway in Hewlett. Call 516-569-5577, 569-5577, on the web at hewlett.minutemanpress.com, and mention Dave's Gone By to get 10% off. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and uh, we're getting musical and cabaretical here on this Sunday <laughs> evening, and very happy to have someone who's gotten into cabaret at a stage in life when people are kind of, well, <laughs> I'm going to be cruel and say people are checking out of things in general, but and I'm looking at him right now, and his eyes are narrowing, <laughs> and he's going, okay. So I'm, I'm not checking out of anything <laughs> right now, God no. God will, God, thank no, God no. for that. Person in the studio with me. Uh, at WGBB, made his debut as a cabaret performer at age 72, but was not his first taste of the music world, of songwriting, of, um, well, he's, he's done Broadway stuff, he's done um, cabaret and regional stuff, he's written songs for the likes of people, everyone from Louis Armstrong has covered his material, to, I, I had a list of Jimmy Durante, mm -hmm. Peggy Lee, uh, Karen Akers, and we'll talk a bit about Michael yeah. Feinstein as well. But sure. Is it Weinstein or Feinstein? Feinstein. Feinstein, sorry. Feinstein, yes. Um, I've got Ray Jessel in the studio. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Ray Jessel, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, welcome thank you, Welcome to the neighborhood. Um, so, let, let's roll it back just to, towards the latest stuff there, where you're 72 years old, and you're thinking, I think I'm going to get up on stage and do my songs. Mm-hmm. How did that, why? How did that happen and why? Um, uh, well, I'd had a career before that in uh, uh, as a writer in television, a comedy writer, and um, I'd written songs occasionally through that period. I was getting back into writing music, writing songs, and going through the very long and difficult process of of making demos of songs and sending out to songwriters, and it was kind of frustrating. And um, actually, Michael Feinstein, who you mentioned, um, Heard some of my comedy songs, which I would do at parties for friends, you know, uh -huh. things like that. And he asked if he could do them in his act, and I said, sure. And after a while, he said, you know, Ray, I'm getting laps with these songs, but really, you should be out there performing right. them yourself. He said, this is, there's nobody doing anything like that anymore, you know. Tom Lehrer doesn't perform anymore. That's Alan, 30 years. Alan yeah. Sherman has passed away from us, and... Um, uh, so there's well, nobody's got Weird Al Yankovic, but that's the, the, yeah, that is, that is different. There's some people who are close, but basically there's not um, certainly there's not many, if there are any uh, com people doing comedy and music. So um, he encouraged me, and at the time I didn't have enough um, songs to make an evening, uh, but I said about that, and when I had enough to to make a, a show, mm -hmm. I. Um, I asked the owner of the Gardenia, which is the cabaret club in Los Angeles, um, if I could have a night and do a show, and that's when I started. Cool. And you felt it went well in the audience? It went responded. very well, and the audience responded very well. And uh, It was just you at a piano, or were there... there just me at the piano, that's it. And as a matter of fact, um, about six months later, I made this CD, uh, and my CD is called Ray Jessel, The First 70 Years. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a live performance at the Gardenia. 
And these are all recent, or fairly recent songs, or do they the, span back? Some of them span, a couple of them span back a few years. Um, but many of them were compar within the six months that, let's say, before I started performing, you know. Right. But you were writing songs long, oh, long, yeah. long, Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. When did yeah. you start that? Well, hmm, I started out my career as a as an arranger and orchestrator. Oh. And um, I met a very talented woman in Toronto, um, in Canada, by the name of Marion Grudev. And she was the um, music director for a, an annual satirical review. Oh. And... Uh, but her and she was a concert pianist and she loved classical music and I was a classical composer uh, uh, making a living as an orchestrator um, but um, she was an enthusiast of the American songbook and she was the one who really started me interested in, in getting me interested yeah. in songs and such so we started writing songs for the together for the what was the name of the review what was Spring it? Thaw it was called okay. it was, you know, in the spring. and then Marion and I um, uh, developed a musical that eventually was heard by a Broadway producer, yeah. Alexander Cohen, and it w he signed us up to write this show called Baker Street, uh, which was uh, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, Holmes yeah. uh, Sherlock Holmes musical, uh, which ran for about mm, ten months or so in uh, oh, so was 90, almost a hit. What 1965, a, a semi, I would yeah. say, a semi hit, yeah, um, in '65, and during that period we were also writing songs for other performers, you know. Uh, in fact, the, the show we did after uh, Baker Street, which was um, was a show which didn't actually come into Broadway, it closed out of town, was a remake of the old Helsopoppin, and we did the songs for that. Was that and the one Jerry Lewis was supposed to be in? The well, there were two of them. Uh, uh, we did the one that Soupy Sales starred in, in uh, which was before the Jerry Lewis okay, one, yeah. and uh, it it um, it played in Montreal at the Expo there. And it's, 69, I guess it was, um, 67, something like that, uh -huh. um, and the title song of that was recorded by Louis Armstrong. Wow. Yeah, which was great, you know, and Jimmy Durante, as a matter of fact, yeah, and so I've always been writing songs, and then um, having done a show which was only a semi-success, and uh, then, a, then uh, a couple of shows which closed out of town, I realized I... You could, if you had a hit, you could make a killing on Broadway, but you couldn't make a yeah, living. Right, yeah. So um, that's when I went out to uh, Hollywood, and um, some of my friends were already working there as writers on variety shows. As they had, they had a lot of variety shows at that right. time, at the end of you know 1970 or so. Sure. And um, I uh, started working on. Uh, I got picked up for to do the Dean Martin show and but not music you're actually no I was I, then I would be changed hats and became a comedy writer wow. occasionally when I got a chance I would do some music uh, things if a show needed a song I you know I was able right. to do that and uh, so what for the Dean Martin show did you yeah I, I actually I went out to do um, I did the uh, the summer show that was produced by the Dean Martin operation it was called the gold diggers okay. and anyway and um I expected to do musical material, but they had somebody doing that, so I changed the sketches. Yeah, sketches, yeah, yeah, sketches and you know, wisecracks or whatever, and cool. uh, and then. Um, what was and, your favorite sketch that you that you oh, either wrote or contributed to? Well, the one I think I, I the best sketch I think was one I did for the, when I was on the Carol Burnett show. Whoa! Okay. Uh, and there was one uh, called the the Pale. And it's a it was a thing for um, Carol Burnett and uh, Harvey Corman, yeah. uh, in which um, Carol is uh, coming to visit the psychiatrist, and uh, the, the, the to re find the reason for her uh, her psychiatric problems nowadays, wow. and they they discover it all stems back to a time when when she was on the beach as a little girl, and some big fat kid came over and took a, stole her pail. And it turns out that the big fat kid was Harvey Corman. <laughs> so anyway, the, then the sketch builds, and uh, that's one of the uh, I, I think that's one of the one of the best sketches. It was certainly one of the best performances, anyway. And, and so I've got a sidetrack here. So what yeah. was it like working writing for the Carol Burnett show? I mean, what was a week like? Um, the Carol Burnett show, unlike some others I worked on, was a very organized. Very uh, business-like um, show, mm -hmm. and there were some various. Um, there were some very very talented writers on the show. Well, Barry Levinson 
who became an important producer, was one of the writers on the show. Uh, the director. Director, director yeah, I mean, yeah, director. Yeah. I, meant, I meant to say director, yeah. We, w we would come up with sketches and run the ideas by the head writer and by Carol, and if they liked it, then we would go ahead and write the things. And, um, and uh, hopefully that would get into the, um, sure. into the show, you know. And how long were you doing that there? On, on Cal Burnett? Yeah. I did that for just one season. Oh, okay. I did one because I was moving on to other things. I went on to be a head writer on a, another show, on a Rich Little show, actually. Oh, my God. The Rich Little, Little Comedy Yeah, hour. that's yeah, right, I yeah. Vaguely remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, there were a lot of variety shows. I guess I did most of them. I I, I, I was a head writer on the last, probably the last variety show, which was The Captain of Tennille. Oh, my <laughs> do you, I do remember that. <laughs> The oh. wonderful thing about variety in those days and writing for variety, the wonderful thing was that they all had guests, star guests on the show, yeah. and you got to write for everybody who was anybody. I mean, I've, I've written jokes for Bob Hope, I've written jokes for Groucho Marx. <laughs> what, like, what, what joke did you write for Groucho Marx? Oh, well, uh, gosh, let me think. Um, oh, there was supposed to be a, a, a an interview between him and... Um, Bill Cosby. It was a Bill Cosby uh, variety show they called Cos, and and, and uh, they were supposed to be discussing the economy. That was the idea. And um, and Cosby asks him, uh, what uh, what do you think about the unemployment situation? And he says, well, and Croce says, uh, well, I, I know a lot about it. Parts of my body have been unemployed for years. <laughs> I think Groucho. I was a kind of part. Yeah, I wrote that. Yeah, so it was wonderful to hear a oh Groucho re yeah. say your line. It was amazing. Did you even get to meet him, or you literally just very him briefly? Him? Well, at that time he was he was old. Yeah. Oh, he was uh, in and out of it. You know, he was sometimes in and out of it a lot. So I, I we sort of met him, but he wouldn't remember me or anything like that. Well, no. But um, but you met everybody. I mean, we worked with Gene Kelly, and you know, I mean, all. These, it was it was great. Well, I did. When, so yeah. going back to music, though, um, I got I was on the Love Boat for a number of years, and I did persuade them to do a musical version of the Love Boat. And um, what was great about that for a songwriter was I did uh, you know four four um, original songs for the show, including the finale. Was that the get the guest stars for that musical oh, was Ethel was Merman. Ethel Merman, Carol Channing, oh. Ann Miller, Van Johnson, <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> Cab Calloway, Della Reese, oh. plus the you know the usual Love Boat yeah, staff, yeah, yeah. Well, but but to have them all singing your song, I want to hear Fred Grandy do this. No, <laughs> they, they, well, it was you know that was it. I mean, they, they did a song. Um, it was a song called "Want to Sing a Show Tune." Which years later, actually, I played for Michael Feinstein, and he used it as his opener in his act for quite a few years. That one so. So why didn't you stop writing for TV? Um, I guess they stopped using me. In other words, there's a huge amount of ageism in in TV. You today, if you're over thirty, forget it. You know, as a writer. And uh, so, in many ways, I I, I kind of say that I wrote posthumously. <laughs> I, remember, I was lucky. I wrote you were in there in the forties and fifties. Yeah. yeah. So um, so at sixty, seventy, you you know, I the last show we did, we 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 wrote actually um, a season for Sherry Lewis for the oh. we're writing songs for um, Hush Puppy and, uh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. Yeah. And Lamb Chop yeah. and Lamb Chop and that was fun but she passed away yeah. you know yeah. and I guess that was it and so the, the the opportunities to get hired unless unless people you knew were going to be right. developing a show you they weren't going to hire you if, um, it became that way and so essentially I went back to um, writing songs Right. Which is my first love, anyway, and um, and then we come around to where I was before, you know. Right. Yeah. So that's that's basically it. So you don't have satellite radio, you don't have an iPod or a hundred music channels on your cable. Doesn't matter. Live365.com has dozens of radio stations in all sorts of formats, absolutely free. And one station, DFSX Radio, plays vintage episodes of Dave's Gone By every Saturday night at 11 Eastern Time. I've even put their link on davesgoneby.org. So just click to hear music and talk and me free on DFSX. I 
I hear the whistle of a passing train. I hear an oboe play a sad refrain. I hear the rain upon my window pane, and I think about sex. The scent of jasmine on a summer night. The song of starlings at the first daylight. The magic of a rainbow at the sight. I think about sex. You may say that I have got a one-track mind. Maybe what you say of me is true. But while you're saying that I've got a one-track mind, I'm thinking about sex with you and you. The restless flutter of a butterfly, a shooting star that streaks across the sky. Some speak of wonder, some of God, but I, I, you got it, sex. You may ask me why do I obsess this much? Can't I think of something else instead? But while you're asking me, I must confess this much. I'm wondering how you'd be in bed, standing alone beside a waterfall, or amidst the frenzy of a shopping mall. It seems as nothing turns me off at all, except maybe writing checks. But after that, I'm back again pursuing it. Each fantasy I have has God knows who in it. Perhaps because I'm not actually doing it. I think about, explore each kink about. I bore my shrink about sex, 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 sex. Sometimes food. Then sex. Hi, this is Ray Jessel, songwriter. Uh, I'm here with Dave on the show called aptly called Dave's Gone By at WGBB. Do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Oh, God. Um, wait a minute. Hold on. They tell me this, and I don't know for sure, but my sister's name, my oldest sister's name was Vivian. Okay. Called Vivi. And it seems that I wrote, You can see me, I can see you, but you can't see Vivi, because she's gone to school. <laughs> you were pretty young. You, you, you're gonna, talented, huh? Yeah. How old were you? Uh, oh, I don't know, four or something. <laughs> <laughs> 23. <laughs> we are talking with Ray Jessel, ladies and gentlemen, songwriter, Singer, uh, comedy, TV comedy writer for, for a long period of time. Um, now, I do want to also still talk a little bit more about the process of putting together a Broadway musical. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I, I was a little surprised at Baker Street. I, I assumed it was like a respected flop, not the fact that it was kind of a near hit. I didn't realize it ran yeah, that long. So, yeah. so that was something pretty um, heartening in the sense. At least it wasn't like them swatting you down immediately and say, oh, well, you're out of here. You're no, not at, um, yeah. not at all. Not at all. Well, it's like a lot of things in life. It's getting that second one, which is the hard one. Hmm. Uh, the one that worked. I mean, we did, as I say, a couple of shows yeah. after that that didn't uh, get anywhere. And that, that's disheartening. Um, but no, it was... Um, so well, well, let's, let's take it, though, from the beginning. You decided to write... This musical. The right commission. No, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I should back, sure. go back up and I'll explain exactly. Um, we were um, involved with BMI, and BMI had started a theater department mm. because most of the theater music musicians were ASCAP up to that time. Okay. So, um, so they had us develop um, an audition score. Um, just, just uh, uh, n uh, that wasn't just 
cabaret songs, individual cabarets, but would have a, a storyline plus a half a dozen songs to give an example of what we could write them. Okay. okay. And we picked the subject of P.T. Barnum. And what we wrote was a Barnum score, not the one that finally got to Broadway. There was a show called Barnum. Right. That was Psych Holman. Psych Holman, yeah. But we did, um, we did the score and um, on that, and there were pretty good songs in it. And um, we got Alex Cohen, uh, through friends, to come and listen to the stuff. And luckily for us, I, we think, um, I think that was part of it anyway, um, Alex Cohen fancied himself as the P.T. Barnum of today, you know. Mm. Anyway... It was like an, a Hollywood movie. We we played the songs for him, and we walked out of there with a with a Broadway <laughs> contract. Wow! To write different songs, not to squeeze to, them in. No, yeah. to to note to 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 expand that 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 show Barnum. Oh! And we spent the next couple of years going around trying to find a book writer, a, a, the writer for the libretto, yeah. um, that. Alex and we would like, and we liked everybody, and Alex liked none of them. <laughs> so, but, all right. Meanwhile, he had the reverse problem with another project, and that project was Baker Street. Hmm. He had a, he had a, he had signed up this show Baker Street, and the libretto was serviceable, but the songs were, were so-so, and. Um, he couldn't get them either to rewrite the songs uh, sufficiently, or, and also he couldn't get directors or choreographers who would do the show. They said, just dump that score, you know. So um, we were brought in at first to interpolate some songs in the score, and then eventually the director at that time, there were three directors we worked with, mm -hmm. but that director said, Give the, the give the kids the show like cool. uh, to, to do the song, song. So that's how we got to do the Baker Street score, right. and then we worked with um, uh, Michael Langham was the first director. He was a British oh, yeah. guy. Yeah, and then he had uh, then because of uh, timing difficulties, he had other commitments. He left the show, and we worked for a while with Josh Logan. Wow! And that was something, and uh, we had a great time with Josh Logan. Uh, for and uh, you know uh, developing the show and um, but all of a sudden Josh was gone because uh, Josh as you know suffered from manic depression severe manic oh. depression wow. and he got into one of his depressive moods and he left the show and so we were looking around for another director and that's how Hal Prince came to direct the show oh okay Hal was looking to be he'd been a producer but he wanted to be hired as a director to do yeah. the show and he came in, and that was terrific in some ways, and not so terrific in others. Because <laughs> he wanted to imprint his thing yeah. on everything. Yeah. Do you yeah. think he spoiled the show? In or some, ultimately in some ways, in some ways. Why? Well, what did he do? Hmm? What did he do? Well, I I don't know whether all of it can be blamed on him. One of the things was that it was not really a huge show. Um, but it was put in a huge theater, so it had to be spectacular. And there were some spectacular things about it. Oliver Smith won a, a, um, a Tony oh. for, for the sets and things. They were they were incredible, hmm. I must say. And um, um, the other thing, though, though, where we we came to blows almost <laughs> uh -huh. well, sitting, was that um, he said, "Well, it's an adventure." It's a in fact we cannot stop for the usual applause after musical numbers. We got to just keep running on and things like that. And that was a big mistake because the audience wanted to applaud, and didn't. And we were we were furious, but we were the new kids on the block, and he was the heavyweight. So you know, so there were frustrations too. <laughs> but when you got through like opening night or yeah. the first week, and you looked at the show objectively, yeah, yeah. did it work or did it not work? Was it in the middle? It worked. Or? It worked uh, pretty well, but there were some problems still. We thought. Mm. There was a song that never quite worked. Um, the first song for the uh, woman in the show, um, and that song never never worked. And uh, there was a new song put in, and that never worked either. Many years later, that's about five or six years ago, the show was redone, was put on in a stage reading at the York Theater. Oh yeah, yeah, the little York Theater sure. there. And and we wrote a new song for that spot, and it worked like a charm. <laughs> Thirty-five years too late. <laughs> well, but again, it wasn't this over. It wasn't a, a two-week closing flop. No, no, not at all. Not it, it wasn't, wasn't really over closing. No, 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 no. It was a nice. It was an interesting and nice show. Yeah. It was so a, after Inga that, Swenson was the played the woman's boy. Hmm. Yeah. But then after 
that show when went scouting around for a second yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, they they run up to you and say, "Okay, we got this property, this property," or well, yes, uh, in a sense, people did come to us with uh, ideas for properties and things, and the number of them we didn't like. But one that came to us was uh, was uh, Jerry Weidman, who had written the the libretto for Fiorello, yeah, among other things. Uh, wanted to do National Velvet. Okay. Uh, and with we, what? Uh, people in horse costumes? Or well, I don't know. I, we uh, we always thought well, you could get by the uh, the horse situation by if you had the races, um, that uh, the same way they did in the Ascot Gavotte, and if you have people looking oh. out towards the station, things that way. Yeah, but that's just a minor part. Of I know, I know. Lady. And you, but you might have to have a horse on the stage somewhere or other in the, in oh, the horse box. Well, that uh, well, you're, you're actually exactly um, the, the the nail on the head. We thought. Well, we were saying. Well, okay, that's a it's a big standard, and here we have a a, a name writer, and he wants to use us, and so we wrote up several songs on spec, and we all went around to David Merrick, and we went in, and he said, "Are you people crazy? Are you crazy? <laughs> what are we going to do?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's bad enough in any. I mean, so, the dogs misbehave and, and I know, yeah. I know, I know exactly. So, um, but yeah, I give, I give that, I give that a, as a for example, yeah. you know. And with the Hell's a Poppin' thing, well, yeah, there was a chance it would be a crazy show in which we would essentially write um, interlude songs, you know, songs which had nothing to do with, uh, oh, okay. with, with the, 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 they'd be crazy. And this would be like a Marx Brothers film, yeah, and then, yeah. and the, then, then a, a, a song would come up as, as a relief from the comedy yeah. things. Uh, except some of the songs we did. We did a song called... Um, the airstrip, which was a kind of a sexy number, it was a dance number. I mean, you performed airstrip. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I performed that. You know, but um, and the opening number, Hell's a Poppin, but then uh, and things like that. Sure, sure. Was, it was more like a review. Well, you think maybe like a review. Because but well, I don't, I don't know whether they. I haven't. I, I heard that Alice Cohen. They couldn't raise the money. Oh, well, that George happened. Abbott was directing was oh, directing right. thing, and so I got to work with George Abbott, which was wonderful. Was he the genius that everybody said he was? Oh yeah, he yeah. was very quiet and very efficient, and at I believe he was eighty two at the time then, and uh, I he used to walk between the offices and the rehearsal hall, and I couldn't keep up with him. It was like well, he was active until like his late nineties. He was still doing it. When I until his hundreds, he was hundred and four yeah. or something. Was oh. still doing things, <laughs> doing things. But and he was very very bright. You know, it's Man, um, yeah. yeah. And then you did do I think um, part of I Remember Mama. Yes, oh, that was a Broadway show. That was Broadway yes, show. that was a little later. That's I I I was out in Hollywood. I was working a, on staff at the Love Boat as a writer there, and I get this call from Alex Cohn. Uh, be in New York tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and I say, why? He says, because if you are, you have a shot at being uh, writing with Richard Rogers. I said, I, I immediately called the airline. Right, okay. And I immediately told the Love Boat people, you got to give me leave of absence here, you know. Wow. So I flew into, uh, what was it? Philadelphia, I guess it was, so that they were they were out of town with the show. Yeah. And they'd run... Oh, in, that was the show. Was, I was wondering they, why it had to be the next day. Yeah, it was Ma Marty Charn, uh, who had been the um, lyricist mm -hmm. of the show, and... Uh, Charn and is best known, of course, for doing Annie. Annie. Right. And he, he, he had been the director of the show, and there had been a falling out between him and Rogers and Cohen and things, because they wanted songs changed, and he wasn't about to change them or about to do them. I think that was basically it, anyway. So Charlie wanted so, Rod, new Rogers or some different, Ro and Rogers was saying, "No, I'm Richard Rogers." Yes, yeah, that, that's right. So um, essentially, then Charlie had left, so they had to find. In fact, they 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 had to find a new uh, lyricist and a new director oh my too. So uh, I came in, you know, to. Uh, 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 as a possible lyricist, um, I guess Alex had played him the um, Baker Street score, sure. and he liked that. It seems, and um, so I got the job, which was as a lyricist. As a lyricist, being written musically by Richard Rodgers. That's right. You got to write songs by Richard Rodgers. That's right. Yes, they ended up with about 
four of them in the actual show, although we wrote a lot more than that. We wrote songs which would go in, and then they would try them, and sure. it didn't work, and then they would go out, and all that thing. What was it like working with him? Well, um, first of all, he was qu quite sick at that time. I mean, in the sense that he was suffering, he had cancer of the jaw, and he spoke yeah. through a voice box, you know. So that was made it a little bit difficult. But um, on the whole, it was very good. I, 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 what happened was... Um, I would write the lyric first. This is the way he liked to work. Um, uh, with Hammerstein, anyway, he, that's the way he worked. So I would write a lyric, and then he would call me over when he had the tune, and I would come with the tune. And he plays this tune for me and on, on this particular song, and I'm playing it I'm playing it down, because, you know, I can play piano and so forth. Oh, yeah. right? So, and I get to one point in it, and my, I kind of turn a little ashen and a little gray, because it's not right, it's not working. And I turn to him and I say, I don't believe that I am saying this to Richard Rogers. And he says, oh, forget all that crap. You know, what, what, when what? You're working your what, way. What, yeah. what, what? It was so great. So I said, how about this? No, 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 no. And then I said, well, how about this? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. And from uh, then on, we were just fine. We had a good time. Oh, that's terrific. That, yeah. That was great. And I, I just, I have to say, when you and Rogers were working on this, you looked at each other and said, who's going to play? And they said, Liv Ullman. You, you must have looked at each other and gone, what? Or Well, that was already decided by the time I got yeah. there. I mean, I think that was one of the things about how the show got on, because they thought, oh my God, who's going to play an Norwegian woman? Well, Liv Ullman, which sounds right. Actually, I think Liv Ullman was the problem in the end. Not even Martin Charney. But she sang, I'm not familiar with it. The semi, part, yeah. semi, but she was very uncomfortable in the whole like, the whole situation. Mm -hmm. She couldn't handle the changes that were being thrown at her all the time, which you have to be able to do. Um, right. And um, um, well, that, well, the other members of the cast, I mean, George Hearn was oh, fabulous. Sure. He was wonderful. Did you ever go through the hell of being out of town with a musical and rewriting from... You know, eleven thirty at night. Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, with Baker Street, we were in um, we were in Toronto, which because uh, Alex had connections with the theater there, um, and so we, we that was one tryout town, and then we were in Boston, and all the time there we were rewriting. So is that what happens? You, you do the show at night, like eight o'clock at night. Yeah. Curtain comes down at down, and then you get notes from the director and what's working, what's not working, and which there might be notes generally for the cast. And then you have a meeting generally with the uh, with the director and the producer, possibly, and um, at like eleven thirty at night. Yeah, or they might just say, "Well, this is late, and we'll meet the first thing in the morning or something," you know. But um, and then when do you get to make change? I mean, you have to well, change a song or write a new song. Yeah, you have to write a new song like overnight, hopefully. Or well, it is overnight because you're waking up. Yeah, with well, the next or day or so, next day, uh, maybe a day or two. And so it's like about a two-day lag between. Yeah. Writing something, and the cast has to Yeah, then the cast has to learn it. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, somebody has to make at least a dummy orchestration. Right. Wow. So, wow. It, there was, you know. Did you enjoy that, or was it too stressful? Was it just, oh, God? Um, I, I found it more, more stressful uh, in, at Baker Street. It was our first show, and in a way it had been our baby, and we weren't happy to do the changes. I was in the reverse position coming in on I Remember Mama and that that was my job was to make changes there. So I, I wasn't knew, coming, it, yeah. it wasn't something I was wedded to anything so I could be a little more objective and uh, and I could just do my task. Although there were, there were panic moments when I, <laughs> I'm not thinking of anything. This is no good. This is not going to work and I've got to have it by tomorrow, you know. Oh, why are you sure. television for the or love for the but wow. but but, uh, but uh, actually the television experience was very useful there because I was often in situations there where I had to come up with something right away you know <laughs> for yeah. that that night's taping you know because well, yeah, because yeah. some piece or other had fallen out and they, you know you needed something else. Yeah. If you love Broadway, Off-Broadway, Cabaret, Opera, and Dance, isn't it time you subscribe to Performing Arts Insider, the ultimate guide to everything on the stages of New York. Listings, reviews, box office, and production news, all at 10% off for Dave's Dong by listeners. To subscribe or get a sample issue, call 516-295-1511. 295-1511. 
or see PerformingArtsInsider.com. We're talking with Ray Jessel, who was just having a fabulous time talking with Ray Jessel about his years in TV, years writing for Broadway, and, and also want to remind folks that you can get his album, Ray Jessel, The First 70 Years, from LML Music. Do you have a website? Is there a place where people can go to... Well, we have one, but it's not that um, organized yet. Okay, uh, but if people want to buy the, your CD... You can, can go to LML Music, or you, they can get it on Amazon, that, that, the, the record there. Or you can, go, you can come to my website, which is very simple, Ray Jessel, at... Well, that's the, your email address. What oh, yeah. Oh, my email is www.raygessel.com. Www. And that's J-E-S-S-E-L. One single L. L. Yeah. They, they took the other L for LML Music, apparently. <laughs> that's right. And oh, I might as well ask, um, since we're talking a little bit before about celebrities and people that you've worked with, famous people. Yeah. Uh, Maud Maggart is featured fairly prominently on this. Yeah, day. she's a dear friend, and I, I just think the world of her, she's just incredible, incredible singer. I mean, I just remember, like, a couple of years ago, Maud, I'd see the name, and then I'd oh, it's Fiona Apple's sister, she's doing... This. And now, she's sort of the cabaret name. What well, She's really gotten up there. Yes, yeah, she has. She's. I think she's going to be back at the Algonquin uh, in February, I think, again. So uh, she sings a couple of songs like Please Don't Let It Be Love, mm -hmm. I'm Out of Here, and Moonlight. No, yeah. I assume most of the songs, if not all, are comical in nature. No, but, but oh. those aren't. I mean, oh. though, the, I would say two-thirds of the songs are comical, or at least of the ones that I sing. Um, in fact, Maud uh, used to guest on my shows when, when we were in the same town at the same time okay. and would sing the songs that I couldn't sing. In other words, the songs that really needed a real voice. For example, Moonlight, you mentioned, mm -hmm. that is, um, that's our lyrics to Claude Debussy's, uh, oh. um, Claire de Lune. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I'd rather hear more to it. <laughs> there you know, you get the idea. See, yeah. that, that's why I didn't do that. <laughs> and, uh, Please Don't Let Me Love is a song from, um, our a musical in uh, in the in progress a work in progress. Uh -huh. um, when I say we, I'm talking about my wife and I, um, Cynthia Thompson. Uh, we work on the lyrics together on the serious stuff. And um, I how do long the music. have you been uh, married? Oh my gosh, it's um, well, we've been together. <laughs> Let's put it that way. We've been together <laughs> for 26 years. Oh, that's not so okay. Yeah, no, I thought you said 40, 50. Years, you know. No, like since, since yeah. 1980, and I guess we got married maybe 10 years later than that, so I guess. Cool. <laughs> think of that. Um, and, um, and is she we're, a professional sing, um, songwriter, or? Well, she is now. Yeah. <laughs> she, well, uh, going briefly through her career, she started out as a location manager for television, okay. and then became a TV writer, and then we... She and I collaborated as TV writers on various things. Oh. Like that. We wrote many scripts for The Love Boat together. She's much better at story than I am, for example. You're, you're the joke person. I'm the joke story. person. She did the story. I think okay. that's what we're getting. And, um, and then uh, we started developing, writing songs together. And um, this particular thing is from a musical version of um, Daniel Defoe's Small Flanders. Never read it. Never read I've it. heard of it. Good read. Good okay. read, very real good read, and um, so anyway, that, yeah. that's one of the songs from it. Please don't let it be love, and um, Maud sings it just beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. 
estate's open secret is that people who own their own home are blessed with the ultimate collateral. Owning a house allows you to borrow money for home improvement, college loans, vacations, and I'll bet you know qualified people thinking of taking out a loan. So why not help them and make some money too? Bring them to MortgagesRock.com, a full-service mortgage broker that teaches you how to make dreams come true. The more clients you have, the more you do on your own, the more commission you make. MortgagesRock.com is there for you. At the website, on the phone, in their South Shore office. Fully licensed in New York State and growing bigger every day, MortgagesRock.com will start you as a broker so you can get richer. Remember, MortgagesRock.com, because making money never sounded so good. Hi, this is Ray Jessel, songwriter and all-around wit. I'm here with Dave on the show Dave's Gone By on WGBB. You were in TV all those years. I was mm -hmm. doing the music and, and stuff like that. We've run across, run through names like Louis Armstrong, Duranty. I mean, give me some anecdotes. Give me some, some things about these people you've met, good or bad. Oh, well, memory. Actual I guess memory. my most memorable experience, and I was telling you about... Uh, being under the gun when you had to write something suddenly. I was working on the Captain and Tennille show, okay, and... So what's we, Tony Tennille really like? No. Tony Tennille's very, very nice. Okay. Uh, they both, they both were. Um, they had a time, there was a show and it was all set and all the rest of it and one of the guests couldn't appear for some reason, so... Um, they managed to get, They somebody found out um, that... Uh, Muhammad Ali was in town, Ooh, yeah. and they would try and get him. So they got him, and Muhammad Ali, and they turned to me and said, "Well, we got to have something for Muhammad <laughs> to do." Yeah. So I'm on the spot. He's going to be taping it that afternoon. That afternoon. That afternoon. So they're looking at, the <laughs> and I'm saying, "I'll come." Up. Anyway, I figured out that well, okay, he likes to do rhymes. He should rhyme, of course. It's a rhymes. That's one obvious thing. Yeah. So what I'll do is. I'll think of the show as if it were a fight and he's the commentator. And he'll oh. do a rhyme commentating on the rounds of the show. Like after each bit he'll say this is round two and da 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 and he'll make a little rhyme yeah. about it, you know. So that's my idea. That's when and so I wrote up of enough rhymes to to to, to, yeah. to and that they would they would tape them all together and then they would edit them into the show. Okay. So I get to the crucial moment when I have to show this stuff to Muhammad Ali, and if, if, because if he doesn't like them, <laughs> we're up the creek. <laughs> you know, what he knows That's very right. Easily, yeah. So I go into this room where he sits with about four or five of his retinue. <laughs> right. I'm interested still when he was Muhammad Ali. Oh now. yeah, 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 and um, and they're all these huge guys. Things are all inside that door there, oh, and, gosh. and I go in handing this thing. And he says, he, and he says, what you got? <laughs> and I give him this paper, and he looks through there, and you, 
<laughs> more, more trembling. <laughs> I'm sitting there like this, and after a while, he looks over to the other guys and says, "He ain't as dumb as he looks." And I knew we were all right. Okay. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "You." Okay. So that was mem that was memorable for me, at least, you know. Yeah. I mean, even when he, he put out his hand to, like, to get the paper there, you, the size of this hand, right. I can imagine what it's like inside a glove, but even the, si the hand is the size of a huge T-bone steak, you know. Gosh. <laughs> you know. That, that's a, that is a great story. How about some, a couple of others? Come on. Uh, do you have any, any celebrities that you wouldn't, wouldn't spit on uh, if they, they looked at you? I mean, they're, they're Oh, like, they were difficult? Yeah. Um... The only really difficult one that I really disliked, I'm sorry to say, um, because we should speak well of the dead, was Sonny Bono. You're kidding me! <laughs> oh yeah, he was... Sonny? Murder. Yes. I was producing, I was a co-producer anyway of a summer show and he was a guest on it. And I don't, don't think he wanted to be a guest on it anyway. And uh -huh. he was just being ridiculously difficult. He, among other things, he wanted to do this medley on his show, or it was a, it, no, it was an arrangement of, uh, of, uh, Try a Little Tenderness. I remember now. But the arrangement was like ten minutes long, and I had to go to him, I said, we only have a half hour show. Yeah, right. So, at the most we can do is cut this thing down to five minutes. He says, no way. I and mean, even that's pretty long for us. That's very long. Yeah. Over the, but I said, well, he's, you know, well, I sat down at the piano with the thing there coming and said, we can cut this. No, you can't cut that. It was like hmm. pulling teeth. It was just awful. It was awful. And, and and that wasn't the only thing. There were a number of other things. Something involving a hat. I can't even remember exactly what it was. Was, it was. This was after the divorce, I assume? There was no yes. chair anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There wasn't chair around. Yeah, there was some other girlfriend around at that time. I'm trying to remember. Oh, man. Quello, Susie Quello, Quello, I think was that one. So you were kind of, you, when he ran into that tree, you were kind of jumping for joy a little bit. No, oh, like, not Served really. him right. No, you know. Not really. I'm not like that, but... I the, am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, most people who are uh, 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 very gracious, I like Gene Kelly a lot. He oh, was, yeah. What a nice man. And he, I've only heard good things he had a great TV technique. TV. I noticed that when he rem I walked up to him and it had been years. I've done worked with him on a special. Soon after I got to Hollywood in like 1970 or so, years later I'm working on the Love Boat and he's a guest on it and he says hello Ray, like that, like not wow. the and then and which was very nice and then I realized that he'd because other people came up to him that he hadn't met before, and say it with, the name was, um, I don't know, Muriel. <laughs> he would say, well, hi, Muriel, nice to meet you. So uh, where are you going to now, Muriel? Yeah, uh, and he would repeat it, and get, get it into sentences with as much as possible, and that would fix it in his head, and that's a, a great thing. Like pure Andrew Carnegie stuff. Like yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah. It worked, yeah, he was nice. Who would you have wanted to really write a song for? It can be someone still living, or, or someone perhaps not? Sinatra. Oh, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying. Uh, never met him, though. Never had him. Never, well, uh, very, very briefly at the end of his life. He smacked your wife around or what? No, <laughs> no, I no he was, yeah, you know, but um, I have a friend, um, Lou Spence, who we've written songs with, and Lou wrote several songs for, for oh. Sinatra, uh, including, you know, Nice and Easy Does It Every Time. Wow. I think that was one of the songs. There are quite a few other people. Do you have a favorite song that you've written over the years? Uh... Oh, a favorite song. Or maybe one favorite comedy song, a novelty-ish number, and one favorite the serious song. I, I guess Broadway the song. favorite so comedy song, um, I, I would think, is uh, the song Life Sucks and Then You Die, <laughs> <laughs> which I describe as my Shirley Temple song. Why would that be your Shirley Temple song? Oh, because it's in the style of a Shirley Temple. You know, because Shirley Temple did these uplift songs about when you're down and, you know, feeling down. Well, if you want right. to perform it together, I can be your Negro. Oh. And I'll <laughs> you along on the staircase. That's right. <laughs> the things are getting And you're still there. bi-coastal, so you'll come to New York. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm still based, I mean, I still, my home is in L.A., and um, I come to New York. I At least last year I came, 
mm, I guess four months out of the year, that, that in right. back in two month stretches. Things. Last August, I was in England doing. Um, are you? In, I, 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 I was a bunch of English in your voice. Are you? From I'm Britain? from Wales originally. Oh. Yeah, I'm from Cardiff in Wales. Anyway, I was in Edinburgh, in Scotland, for the Edinburgh the Fringe Festival. Yeah. Um, which was on in August, and then I did a couple of shows in London, which was. You're nice. right. Not, you're you're just not slowing down. No, at no, no, no. All. As a matter of fact, there's people now. Uh, I'm touching wood here that are working on a tour. Well, not my book, hopefully. No. No, uh, touching. Uh, uh, working on a tour for me in England, so that may happen in the spring. Oh well, well, best of luck with that. Well, and thank I, you. I certainly hope people can catch you. Um, at Don't Tell Mama and other venues in New York. Oh, when they are back on. on oh, they. W- I will be back here. Yeah. Oh, so Ray Jessel, I'm assuming I'm doing the Gene Kelly thing here. Yes. So Ray Jessel, <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> your, I guess, next goal is to keep doing these cabaret performances. You're working on that musical with your wife. Any other dreams, goals that you're um, for the next couple of years? We have a couple of projects with the aforementioned Michael. Einstein uh-huh. that we're working on, um, and uh, in which uh, Michael will be doing the music and we'll be doing the lyrics. Terrific. And things can't really go into it more than that, but um, we're having fun. Well, it's been tremendous fun talking to Ray Jessel in the neighborhood. Thank you so much, and best of luck. Thank you, Dave. When things dark and gloomy, I don't let the dark get to me, but instead I hold my head up high, I don't wallow in self-pity, I just sing this little ditty, life sucks, and then you die. Hard knocks have bumped and thumped you Your sweetheart's gone and dumped you For some clown Well, don't break down and cry Go get stinko, go get blotto And then just repeat this motto Life sucks and then you die Then unhappiness and then you're dead Expect the worst and anything less You're ahead Life hurts and there's no ointment Hope just means disappointment Human kindness, ah, don't even try Women are bitches, men are pricks. Meanwhile, that clock just tick, tick, tick. Life sucks, and then goodbye. So let's share our misery now. Come on, people, sing with me now. Life sucks, and then you die. Hey, you're good. It's all a crock. This life ain't worth spit. Take my word. First you're in huck, then you're in sh- FCC. <laughs> then in turd. <laughs> and don't count on the hereafter. Harps and wings, excuse my laughter. Hell may be, but heaven, it's a lie. This life here is all we got, folks. And it is already shot, folks. Life sucks, and by the by, no blue skies, just stormy weather. Come on, guys, now all together. Life sucks, and then you die, and then you die. Wait, did he just say these are the Daves? 
He did. Van Morrison is singing about Dave's Gone By and the CDs we have of the show. Dozens of complete episodes available on cassette and CD. Eleven dollars a piece, shipping included, and cheaper if you buy more. Add a dollar for an autograph. Visit davesgoneby.org to get these gracious presents today. Psst, you wanna buy a watch? No? How about a dishwasher? Vacation to Europe? Well, what's wrong with selling my stuff this way? How else? Advertise on Dave's Gone By? Take a 30 or 60 second ad on the radio? I can't afford that. I can. And I'll reach thousands of listeners all over America? Well, how do I... Dave's Gone By dot org has all the info. Rate card and everything? Done deal! Hey, before I go, wanna buy a raincoat full of watches? Yes, indeed, a raincoat full of watches. That has been what this program has been to me. A veritable, not a raincoat, a rainbow full of watches, listening to Ray Jessel. Just, just marvelous. The songs and the uh, just the conversation, really, really great. And I do hope he gets back to New York soon. Jeff, yes? And, and trust me, you can't afford uh, to sell stuff on this uh, show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty the much. advertising rates are incredibly low, low, low. They really are. And, and you really should, if you're interested in advertising on Dave's Gone By, because it's cost-effective and just plain effective, Drop All you email. have to do is ask the people at MortgagesRock.com. Or Performing Arts Insider Theater Magazine or... The Minuteman Press. Or even... Fancy Fancy Balloons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it works really you well. never remember that one of all no. ones. <laughs> but anyway, we love all our sponsors, and if you want to become one of them, email me at davesgoneby at AOL.com or drop me a line at 516-295-1511. Well... I want to do some thank yous. Thank you so much to Ray Jessel. Thanks to the folks at Appleseed Records for and, making that happen. And, and thank Georgie Jessel. And thank you, Georgie Jessel, for, for being dead so that I won't confuse you with Ray Jessel. And then that would have been a real mess because I'd be calling one guy and then the other guy. It would, would have been a problem. Anywho, uh, <laughs> thank you to my wonderful wife, Joyce, who's, who's two weeks away, knock wood. Boom, boom, boom. From giving birth? From, well, yes, from giving birth to a wonderful 200-page dissertation. <laughs> and the birthing process, it's been a long gestation, ladies and gentlemen. It's about five years. So when it comes out, it's going to be a full blown It's going to be a mammoth. <laughs> yeah, right? It's going to be a middle-aged thing. <laughs> <laughs> And what is her, her gestation on? I mean, what is her dissertation on? Oh, you don't even want it. Like old people and, and how the level of depression and how that's rated and all that stuff. Oh, that's and so old. cool. Can we call her up next week and talk to her about that? Not next, the week after. The week for after. Christmas. After it's done. We'll talk about her dissertation. We'll have a dissertation for Christmas. Yeah. I'm afraid to put her on the air because she'll say horrible things about her school. And I don't, we all need to do that yet. She's got to get the degree first. What anyway, school does she go to? Um, Fordham, Fordham University. So she go say bad things about Fordham? Perhaps. I'm not going to say anything until she gets her dissertation, please. <laughs> Let's let her get it first. Then the dissing may begin. By the way, but without dissing some of our other uh, good friends of the program, like the guys at Indecent Exposure Radio, Saturdays midnight till 6 a.m. Sundays on WVOX 1460 a.m. in New Rochelle and streaming uh, live at WVOX. Dot com. Listen to Swing City Vic Sunday nights at 9 on WGBB with Vic Fusco. And listen to Radio Psychic Joyce Keller Wednesday nights is at she, 11. Is she going to be here for our um, a New Year's Eve show? Well, this is the thing. We're going to try and get as many WGBB radio hosts as, as we can to become part of the big WGBB New Year's radio party. Hosted by me, co-hosted by Jeff. New Year's Schlocking Eve. New Year's Schlocking Eve, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're mother schlockers, ladies and gentlemen, from 9 until 12.30 in the morning on That's New Year's. Funny. Well, we might go to one, depending on how nice the gospel people are. Of course, if we keep going into their time on the regular pace, it might not be so nice. But, but it's really cool. And, and we'll be here. We're going to try and get as many GBB hosts to be part of it. Either they'll be calling in or they'll come in live or maybe they'll pre-tape some stuff. Some maybe Charlie highlights. Gross will call in. Yeah, I might get some from people who were on my show over the past year or two to call. It might be, it could be really my fun. Co my, my co-host at my other other show. That's right. Well, you might as well tell That would be Two on the Isle. I was going to give him a plug anyway. Yeah, do it. Do it. Two on the Isle on, what is the state? Where? It's Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And then Channel 34? Something? I don't know where it is. It's not in I think Channel 57, 69, something like something that. Something like that. At Friday's... I think at 8 o'clock. Yeah, you do a hell of a plug, Jeff. I know. Well, you know. All I'm saying is, if you want to find out more about that, MNN 
dot org, and you can see Jeff every other week with Charlie Gross. They co-host a theater show that's kind of a Cisco and Ebert, but for the theater. So, anyway, reminding everybody to catch a vintage episode of this show, Dave's Down by Thursdays and Saturday nights at 11 on DFSX Radio on Live365.com. Go there. Just find out more at my website, davesgoneby.org. By the way, still at my website is a link to the Robin Hitchcock Festival at WUSB that I took part in and was on mic quite a bit of, and a lot of great Robin Hitchcock music there. So go to the special events link on WUSB.FM. WUSB.FM. What How is Psycho? Psycho. The Robin Hitchcock Festival. No, it's psycho uh, and... Oh, oh my God, your mic just went off. Oh dear, how did that happen? But... <laughs> hey, 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 hey. It's on, it's on. Okay. Gotta, gotta wrap it up. Okay. Um, just some upcoming guests, by the way, on the show. We've got, uh, the crossword editor for Newsday, Stanley Newman. Otherwise known as the Rear Cross. <laughs> Nicely put. Three we've got a five down. <laughs> uh, Gary Gladstone, who wrote a book about differently weird named states and, and cities in America. He went to these places and took photographs. And, and so that's, that's kind of fun names. Like Scott Run, Pennsylvania. What was that? Scott Run. Scott Run. Run which people, about Scott Run? Yes. It's good Scrum. stuff. Um, now, the main thing is, I will be here on, new. Uh, well, aside from the next couple of weeks, also and on And don't Christmas forget the 200th episode. That is two weeks from now. December 17th. The day has gone by 200th episode. We'll be playing clips and highlight stuff over the past, either the first, all of the episodes, or at least the past two 100 episodes. We'll be playing on that night. The week after that is Christmas Eve. I will be here doing a very unorthodox Christmas show. And the week after that is Actually, our New Year's sort of party. Orthodox. Yeah. Bum, bum. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Look, we've got to run. Okay. But, Jeff, thank you so much as ever for being here. And New Year's Eve. We'll be here New Year's Eve. From 9 till 12.30. So be with us for that. And, if, oh, and, and of course, this coming Thursday, we start the big time. On, w, on a different radio station, WUSB 90.1 FM out of Stony Brook. You can listen on the web, um, WUSB.FM. It's from 3 in the morning, early Friday, going into Friday at 6.30 a.m. Music, comedy, talk, kind of like Dave's Gone By, only free form, looser, more music. Uh, I don't think Jeff's going to be I'll there be for the first one, but, but he will be there in subsequent ones. I'll be there Checking out. All of this is at my website, davesgoneby.org. Well... I'll be back next week. Jeff will, I hope, be back next week with yes. me here next Sunday. Yes, I fly to California tomorrow, and I come back Saturday, Sunday morning just to be back on Dave's Gone By. December 10th, 2006, the 199th edition of Dave's Gone By. So until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz wishing you good night, hooray, and gone by. They say... You gotta have a dynamite finish You gotta have an ending that's strong But I haven't got a dynamite finish So I'll have to sing my opening song How do you do, folks? Have to sing my opening song I see some new folks Have to sing my opening song